Okay. Hey, everybody. Great. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to South by Southwest. And uh, I'm really, really excited to be a part of this panel. And uh, when I was told about it from my friend Mike Jacobs, that he was putting it together, um, and asked me if I would come out, I, I made, made sure that I could be here because I admire the men on this panel so much and the incredible work they've done. And I, I think somebody said it best, it was about, it's about 60 years of some of the greatest music and recordings of all time that these guys have done uh, when you really span everything. So I'm gonna introduce our panelists right now. Uh, and these, this is a record producers panel. And I'm gonna start out uh, with Shell Talmy. Shell, I'm gonna check out Shell. Good morning or good afternoon, I guess it is to you. It's morning here for me. Yeah, Shell is back in uh, California. But he will be Correct. here with us. But you're really here with us too, Shell. So it's great to have yes, you on the panel. And, and a hi to all the rest of the panelists. Uh, I hope to meet all of you in person sometime in the near future. That'd be great. And uh, by the way, hello to everybody in the room. Thanks for attending. That sounds great. You got it. Looking forward to meeting you too, Shell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, Shell, it's amazing uh, as we go down this. Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to everybody, but I'm going to introduce everyone first. So. I want to introduce you folks to Rob Forboni. So let's hear it for him. Yeah. Mark Needham is right next to Rob. And, and Bob Rock right there on the end, guys. Now, we're gonna, I want every artist, uh, or every, I'm sorry, every producer who, in my opinion, are artists too. Um, and a lot of them are, which you'll find out. We're going to talk to him, and I want to start with Shell. Shell, you have an incredible history going back to some of the most iconic recordings of all time, the things that you've produced from, you know, as everyone knows, those, all of those great King singles from You Really Got Me to Sunny Afternoon and, and uh, the Who stuff that you did from I Can't Explain and My Generation, Easy Beats, Friday on My Mind, doing the early Bowie recordings, which were so great. Um, but you have an incredible story that starts here in the States, so would you uh, give us a little background and tell us how you started out in Chicago, ended up in L.A., and then over in Britain? Okay, well, I was born in Chicago, raised there up until the age of around 15 or so when my parents decided to move to L.A., and I thought it would be a good idea to come along. So uh, well, I wound up here, and um, uh, uh, eventually I became, um, as I started TV and then discovered that... Uh, all that corporate stuff wasn't wonderful for me, so I became a recording engineer, and uh, the guy I worked for at Conway Studios was English, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to go to England before life passed me by, so uh, I went ostensibly for a five or six week vacation and wound up staying 17 years because uh, I kind of um, uh, bluffed my way into a job when I walked into Decca Records, and uh, my friend Nick Benet, who was at Capitol at the time, said, take my uh, uh, records and if you want to tell him you use them, that's cool. And so I played uh, two of Nick's things that he'd just done, which were the Beach Boys and Blue Rolls. And I said, thank God you arrived, you start today. So <laughs> by the time they found out it was uh, a bunch of lies, I already had a huge hit, so I decided to stay on. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a catch-22, right, Shell, that you have to... Have the hits to get the job, but you you know have to have the job to make the hits. So that worked out. I, that I way. think I think you you said that exactly right. Yes, yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. And um, so we're going to be back to you in just a few minutes, Shell. Rob Verboni. Now, Rob, you've worked with some incredible people as well. I mean, working with Bob Dylan with the band and having you know remastered the entire catalog of Bob Marley. Uh, working with the Stones and Keith Richards and winning a Grammy with Keith. Tell us about how your start. Well, me, I started out as a drummer, and then uh, I had an injury. I was 15. I started playing drums when I was 11, and then I hurt my, I cut my hand very bad, and it took a year to heal. And a friend of mine's dad was teaching us electronics on Friday nights on a blackboard in the garage. And uh, so the natural thing happened. I couldn't play. <laughs> and the electronics and the music came together. I started recording my friend's bands and I never got back into, uh, into, into playing again and I just stuck with it. And then I, I, did, I couldn't get a job in Los Angeles and so I moved to New York when I was 18. I went to the Institute of Audio Research which was the only 
recording school in the country. Yeah. And I happened to land a job two days after I was there at the record plant, which was kind of amazing. At the, it was at a time when it was the record plant was the, the studio. So I stayed, I was there for uh, a few years and then I got a call from the Village Recorder and uh, I got an offer to go out there and uh, with a, for a good job. So I went and took that and I ended up the chief engineer of the village for three years and then I did Planet Waves with Dylan and the band there and I went on the road in the tour they did in 1974 as a, a front of house a sound consultant. I wasn't actually mixing, I was just walking around listening and kind of the liaison between the band and the front of house guy. And it was sort of the first time anybody ever did that. And, uh, and that worked out well. And when I got back, the band wanted to make another record. They had made Big Pink in a house in, you know, in, Woodstock, in Saugerties. And so they wanted to get a house and put a studio in it. And so uh, we, Rick Danko found a house, just like he found Big Pink. He found a house in Malibu. And I designed a studio, put it in there, rented the equipment from the village. And then we had that for a year. And I bought it from them and then kept it for 10 years. And, the pe all the people that I met on that tour with Bob Dylan well, kept me busy for about 10 years, you know, because he had, that was the first tour he did after his motorcycle accident. And, and so everybody that was anybody came to see him. And I met all these people and it, I never needed a manager or anything. It was just uh, one of those crazy things. That it's just, just from the meeting of people. So that was basically it. And I, I, I was very into recording and, and engineering for a while. But when I started producing, I realize that you can't wear two hats. You know, you, I mean, you can listen back to something as an engineer, and you're listening to the sound, but you're not really listening to the music. You know, and so that was, I only did one record that way, and then I quit engineering after that, and uh, and just got into producing. So that's basically in a nutshell. And I became vice president of Island Records. I, I got on the other side of the fence for a while, yeah. which was interesting. You know, that was going cool, working with people. That's how the Bob Marley well. stuff happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. Now, Mark, we got Mark Needham right here. Mark, tell me about your background and the way that you started out. I was a guitar player, drummer, and started a... I came to San Francisco when I was 16 and started a music school, kind of a rock music school. With some, and as part of that, I got a two-track recorder, and I found a little four-channel preamp, an Altec preamp, and two microphones, and I started a little studio in a, in a closet, basically, at the recording school. Uh, I mean, at the music school, and the, the, you know, I just started recording more and more people, and then I took over half the building with the studio, and then I got another building down in Howard Street in San Francisco and built three studios, and it just it kind of grew from there, and I just, it, you know, so that's pretty much all I've ever done since since I was 16. I um, was in San Francisco till 2000, and then came down to LA, and we've also had a since 1970, we had kind of a the big part of what we did was artist development. That's something that I focused on, and we've had a lot of success with that over the, with Chris Isaac, um, The Killers, Imagine Dragons, Neo Trees. So that we've had some of those that actually took off and turned out to be pretty exciting projects. Yeah, they're but, great ones. So that, that, that's, that's kind of what I've done in a nutshell, I guess. That's great. Now, Bob, we've got Bob Rock on the end, and Bob, uh, you, you started as an artist, an artist I was a fan of, uh, you know, from Canada. You were from Winnipeg originally, right? And then, um, uh, yeah, I was born in Winnipeg, and my parents moved out to the West Coast in the late 60s. Uh, I was supposed to be a hockey player, but there was no ice in the West Coast <laughs> of Canada. So <laughs> what I did is I stayed in my bedroom and listened to records. And I guess really my start was uh, when I started... Uh, you know, I just love the sound of records. Always was wondering how they did that, including some of the records that Shell made, like my generation. How did, how did that happen? Why does it sound like that? From that, I got a job at Little Mountain, a studio in Vancouver, basically sweeping the floor in 1976. And I've been making records ever since, now almost 40 years. And really, I've just had an incredible journey. You know, both as an artist, I was also an artist on A&M IRS, the Paolas. And uh, so I was kind of working in a studio, trying to be an artist, and then making records. And that's what I continue to do. That's my art. That's what I love to do. Yeah, that's great. I love those, uh, I love those Paola records. I Thank you. Those yeah. records. I, 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 I know, my was like to, to the best underrated Christmas song, Christmas is Coming, <laughs> that you guys wrote as well. I love that. I really do love that track. 
was waiting to tell you that today, which is incredible. <laughs> now, Shell, tell yes, us sir. about the, the first encounters that you had when you started working in that period uh, with The Who and The Kinks. How were, how were things done? How were those bands introduced to you? Um, did you, were you out? Did you go out and see them live? Was it part of? Oh no, I, yeah, I was certainly going out. <clears throat> excuse me, I was going out and seeing bands, but um, the Kinks. Um, I was in the right place at the right time. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I was uh, visiting a publisher in Denmark Street, which was the place where all the publishers were, and uh, one of the Kinks managers walked in with uh, an acetate of who were then the Ravens. And he said, anybody here like to listen to him? I said, I'm here, I'll listen. And uh, loved what I heard and uh, brought them into Pi Records. And uh, we started making records. I mean, the first, actually the first uh, record I made with the Kinks was uh, what Pi ordered me to do, which was uh, uh, the... Uh, can't remember who the hell it was. Doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, anyways, we, the 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 second session included "You Really Got Me," and that's where it took off from there. It's Little great. Richard, sorry, it was the first record. Yeah, that's amazing. That's great stuff. And what about the Who? What was your the first? Who, was um, it, uh, because I had done the Kinks, I had a lady who was working for me part time was friendly with one of the Who management, and so they got to me through her. And I went to go see them. Uh, they were rehearsing in a church hall. And I think, seriously speaking, uh, I heard maybe four bars, maybe six bars. And I said, yes, I will sign them. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. And that, uh, you know, those iconic uh, sessions that you did there. And then, you know, working with bands, w once that success and the continued hits that the Kinks were doing at the time and the early Who hits, Fans like the Easy Beats, and people were kind of also seeking you out at that point, weren't they? Right, yes, they were. You know, and, and creation. Let me just ask you about the creation quickly. Uh, to, yes. Uh -huh. Tell me, because, you know, you and I once had a conversation about how we thought that band could have been much uh, more the, huge. And the band should have been and probably would have been as big as the Who if I had... Uh, if I could have managed to keep them together, I just, they had a couple of number ones uh, all over Europe and in the charts in the UK, and I just made a, a very large deal for them for America with Atlantic, and they broke up. I could not keep them together. I tried everything that I could think of, and it didn't work. Yeah, well, at least you left the great recordings that you did with them, and we have those. Uh, thank you. And when you heard that they, they got back together to do, you know, Little Stevens that show and there were some other shows there, were you, were you happy to hear that they, they did some stuff? Oh, yeah. No, these, I'm, I'm still friendly with the, you know, all that are left. There's a couple that are no longer, no longer with us. But uh, Eddie Phillips, who was the lead guitarist, I still think is probably the best known, unknown guitarist in the whole of rock and roll. Uh, or the best guitarist who is unknown in the, in the whole of rock and roll. He's brilliant. And uh, he was the first one to do the uh, violin bow on the guitar that Jimmy Page finally took up. Yeah, uh -huh. he was the first one. Yeah, exactly. You see that, that early footage and all those photos as well. Mm -hmm. I'm Jeez. impressed by that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me too. <laughs> well, thank you, Shell. Rob, let's talk thank about you. some of your early recordings. Like you said, when you started working uh, with, with Dylan and the band, what was, what was some of those first experiences like? Well, there's, the a couple, there, there's two interesting things. One, I mean, the Beach Boys was the first thing. The first thing I did that got on the radio was Sail on Sailor. And uh, that was an interesting situation where we cut this track. They, Brian had written the song with Van Dyke Parks and um, Ray Kennedy. And he had a title, which was Sail on Sailor. But uh, he didn't have, uh, you know, there were no lyrics. And, and it wasn't fleshed out. So we ended up cutting this track, Carl Wilson... Ricky Vitar and Blondie Chaplin and Jerry Beckley from America was around at the time. He did, they all sang on it. But anyway, we cut the track and then Brian came to the studio one day and he was in his period where he was a bit, bit out there. And it took him, there was a village recorder and the, there was a mirror on one wall of the Studio A and, and uh, it took him about five minutes to walk from one end of the studio to the other for looking at himself in the mirror. And then he came in the control room and he heard the track back. 
He didn't know what it was for sure, but he heard it and he said, oh, that must be Sail on Sailor. And Carl said, yeah. And then he went over to this, this uh, JBL speaker and turned it around 180 degrees and said goodbye and left. And, uh, and so, um, so then, so then the, you know, we continued to work on the track. And then the next day, uh, the manager, uh, he, um, right, Jack Riley was their manager at the time. And, and so Carl said, said to Jack, uh, you know, we got to get some lyrics together. So Jack Riley sat down at the piano and wrote the lyrics for Sail on Sailor in 20 minutes. He just, the manager. And, and so then Dennis, they, they, there's a famous story about the Beach Boys that they never surfed, right? So, but Dennis did. And so Dennis was, came to visit us. And so Carl said to Dennis, why don't you go out and sing this, right? So Dennis goes out in the studio and stand in front of the mic. Now the village had a exit in the back of the room like you could get out of the studio from the back but you could also go into the control room so Dennis was in the studio singing and so he gets through the first verse and the first chorus and then he gets starts the second verse and he goes hold it hold it and he says Carl says what's wrong and he says man I got a new board out in my car and he said all I can think about is going surfing he said I'll see you guys later <laughs> and w went out the back door never even came in and said goodbye to us in the control room so then, then Carl turned to Blondie Chaplin, who was sitting on the couch, and said, Blondie, why don't you go try this? And he went, he went out and sang, sang, did two takes, and the, we used the first verse of the second take and the rest of it from the first take, from the first chorus to the end. So that was kind of a fun story. And then the, the, Dylan and the band thing is pretty interesting because I had never done a record where everything was recorded live, right? So, and I hadn't met any of these guys, so I got to the studio and Robbie Robertson comes out of the control room as I'm walking towards the control room and he introduces himself. Now, I was the biggest fan of the band and I never thought I was going to work with them. You know, I mean, I heard it up on Cripple Creek on the radio in my Volkswagen in L.A. and I was like, Jesus, I would love to work with them. I thought, that ain't going to happen. They're in New York. I'm in L.A. And next thing I know, I find out that Dylan's coming to the studio, but I don't know that the band is coming yet. And I'm the chief engineer. I have to decide who's going to work with who and all that. But I, did, I wasn't even thinking about doing the record necessarily because there was another project that was interesting at the time. Then I found the band was coming. And that was the end of that, right? So Robbie introduces himself and he says, uh, immediately says to me in the first you know, minute that I know him. He says, just, I just want you to know something. Bob has never done a vocal overdub in his life. And he said, so just so you know that all this is going to be done live. And I was like, oh, interesting, right? So, and actually, you know, he never did a vocal overdub until uh, he got to serve somebody on Slow Train Coming. That was the first time he ever overdubbed a vocal in his entire career, it's, which he's done since, you know, but he hadn't to that point. So anyway, we did that record in, in four days and... Uh, Interestingly, they were rehearsing for a tour, and, and because Bob was recovering from his motorcycle accident and, you know, for eight years, and he finally was going back into the public. So they were rehearsing in Malibu up at this place, you know, some uh, Jewish boys' camp that it, during the, it was during the summer, and this was in winter, and they, so it was vacant, and they were using that place to rehearse, and so up in the mountains. And they, they worked three songs out at the rehearsal that they, when they came to the studio to do the record, they only knew three songs. Now, Robbie told me recently, and like a year ago, we were talking about this, and Bob would leave the session that night, like the night of the first session. We cut the three songs. Actually, the first day, Levon Helm wasn't there, and we did, Richard Manuel played drums that day, and we used one song. We cut eight songs that day, like House of the Rising Sun and all kinds of crazy things, but... Anyway, we used one of the songs from that day that made, that made the record. Then Levon came the next day. And so they did these three songs that Bob had written. And then he went home that night and wrote the songs for the next day. And, then we and, they, and they didn't even rehearse the songs. They were watching his hands. I mean, yeah. for the chord changes. Nobody wrote anything down. A lot of these things were first takes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like first the Al Cooper story, right? When he was watching him do like a Rolling Stone, and he was just following just a exactly, little bit behind. Yeah, him. and I mean, I couldn't. But that's how good the band was, though. They they just washed his hands, and they, no mistakes. I mean, never no problem. And then he'd leave the next day and record and write the songs for the next day. But I didn't know that part. I thought those songs had all been written ahead of time. Yeah. But Robbie just told me this recently, because there was all this controversy about the, when they were doing this basement tapes thing and. You know, they apparently found this pad of with with a, with a flare pen. You know, that that legal pad with all these lyrics. And Robbie said, "This that's absolutely impossible." He said, "Bob wrote all of his songs on a typewriter." He said, "There was a typewriter at Big Pink," and he said that a couple of songs there were lyrics. Robbie had a couple of songs that were started that weren't finished that were 
typed, but this thing about, it's, it's still a mystery about these handwritten lyrics. <laughs> but anyway, so that's basically what happened. We did the record in four days, and, uh, and we mixed it uh, fairly quickly, and uh, that was that. And it yeah. was just amazing. That's amazing. Before I go down to Mark, I just want to say. And everything live, you know. There was two overdubs. There was yeah. a piano overdub, and there was one background vocal overdub, and that was it. It's incredible. Yeah. And the Sail on Sailor, Sailor Story, great song, by the way. I don't know yeah, if you I saw. I that song. I, I still love that song. It's amazing. Yeah. I saw Sean Lennon and Mark Ronson do it at the, the BBC proms. Oh, wow. And I was talking to Sean and Mark about it. And uh, they were just saying how much they loved it. But you can just finish that one story by saying, they ended up all suing each other over the song, right? Who wrote the most? And yeah, yeah. Were that's you depositioned true. in that? Did you have to deal with, with no, any of that? No, I didn't, have to, I didn't <laughs> have to get involved in that. But the one funny thing about that song was this, that... We went to this other studio one night for in Burbank. I can't remember if it was Guy Stevens' this place or somebody. I can't remember, but anyway, we, we did this mix at like, I just remember that we started this mix at like one o'clock in the morning. And, um, and Carl loved bass so much that I didn't know what to do about it. So what I did was I took a couple of pull techs and patched them into the monitors and boosted the bass so that it wasn't gonna get on the tape, right? Yeah. And so we did this mix and I, in two, two and a half hours, and I thought, well, this, we're never gonna use this, right? That's ended up being the mix that we used, right? Yeah. It's like the funny, like when I did that record with Keith Richards that we won a Grammy, we, it, we spent a two and a quarter hours on that song. From the beginning of the recording to the end of the mix, yeah. two and a quarter hours. One rough mix and we couldn't, we, li we listened to it and said, we're never gonna beat that. And we never even bothered to try. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's great. It's just, uh, it's a great song. It really is. Guy Stevens, by the way, is another great producer who's no longer with us, who, you know, worked with uh, Mott the Hoople and did the Clashes on the Calling. Um, but, you know, I'm gonna move down to Mark. Mark, tell me about your first really memorable recording experience. Uh, I mean, I guess like the first label album that I did was with uh, Taj Mahal, and I was, I was extremely, extremely nervous. We'd, I had, we had a, we were actually just re, we'd put a new console in that we'd actually made. We'd made our own 24 track. We, we built out of a video recorder, and we'd built a console, and we were trying to get it wired before Taj was coming in in two days. Um, so the Grateful Dead sent some of their guys, wiring guys down with Owsley, and he was dropping acid in their eyes while they're wiring, <laughs> wiring the series. He's like doing the little Miri droppers in their eyes, and I'm just watching this going, no oh way. my God, Taj is gonna walk in here in two days. This is my, my first big label album, and yeah. you know, it's gonna be a catastrophe. But uh, uh, remarkably, everything worked, including our, our homemade 24 track and, yeah. and all these snakes. I, I, I just couldn't imagine like, yeah. Wiring up a, underneath a console, wiring snakes on acid. But yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> every, everything seemed to work. Taj showed up at. We'd actually been at the end of a really long night, like five in the morning, and Taj showed up at five in the morning with. He'd gone out and caught like. 300 pounds of salmon or something, and he came in and had all this, brought, brought like a full kitchen with him, set up and cooked all these meals we're gonna be for the next couple days, and every, everything worked. I was so surprised, and uh, it, you know, he, he was such an interesting guy to work with, uh, a, a great musician and a real interesting character to hang with, so it was, it was kind of my first introduction into working on, you know, my, my first kind of big label album, and um, it was a lot of fun, he, you know, we went, went on to do three or four more records together. That's Those right. Great records, by the way. Now, Bob, you, being an artist, but actually starting out doing engineering and working in the studio, tell us about your, 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 your early experiences of recording. I, you know, I know you are a huge fan of Mick Ronson's, who's produced so many great records, and you know, we just lost Bowie recently. We lost Mick a while back. And uh, so well, if you could talk about that, that'd be great. Um, really, working at Little Mountain, <clears throat> I did a lot of jingles as an engineer, and that's really where I learned how to engineer and mix, basically. Uh, but in the late 70s, a big punk scene happened in Vancouver like it did the rest of the world. So I, at night, I got a chance to work with all the punk bands because nobody really wanted to work with them. And so from that, uh, I guess some of the, uh, particularly a, a producer, Bruce Fairburn, um, asked me to do the first Loverboy album, uh, which was, uh, he kind of wanted a rawer sound. From yeah. that, 
uh, that was really the start because that was the first band that I, I did where I recorded and mixed something that was a number one in America. Yeah, the so, Turn Me Loose in the right, you know, right? Yeah, Turn Me Loose, yep. Yeah. And um, from there, uh, you know, I think what you, what you realize is your work gives you more work. So from that record where I had my first number one, uh, basically it was uh, Loverboy again, and from that, Bon Jovi, from that, uh, Aerosmith, and so on and so forth. So that was, uh, that's really the starting point. And uh, it's, it, it's, you know, the funny thing is, is I remember maybe about a year ago, I was yeah. mixing a record, it might have been, it was this young band called American Bang. And I thought, I wonder what, if I've gotten any better. So I listened to Working for the Weekend and compared it to what I was doing. And sonically, it sounded exactly the same. And I realized that really, that's just the way I hear music. Yeah. And that's so, whether it's Michael Buble or it's Metallica or whatever, really the sonic part of it and the way I hear music is, is the same. I had yeah. the same experience. Yeah, I did it's kind of, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting how that's just kind of how you hear it. Right. Within, within all the context of all the bands I've worked with as an engineer, mixer, and as a producer, there's, there's always what I've tried to do is retain the, the kind of personality of a band and not, never kind of fool with that aspect of it. But sonically, and the way I hear records is, is just really going back to the history of making records is the way I hear music. So yeah. there you go. You know what, I, th I want to say something about that. You know what that shows is that you're not guessing. And that's the thing, like a lot of people are guessing, you know, and, and, well, and that's what I think that shows. It's just that like you know what you want and you can hear it and it's consistent. I did, I did a radio show and it ended up being like one song from every record over 30 years. And I was like, I didn't know if I was going to be depressed or happy at the end because they all I thought I, thought I was getting better at this, but it was all the same, just like you well, said. Well, yeah, I think, I think what, you, what you learn, it's so much about the beginning of recording and making records, you learn the technical aspects and, and a certain method or whatever, and then you unlearn them because you, right. what you learn is, is, is how to make music. One of the big things for me as an engineer and also being an artist is, is learning. It's really about the artist itself. We're there to make a record for them to, <clears throat> it's not my record. Right, and that, exactly. And that's, that's a real, you know, that's a learning curve that, that, that happens. But I mean, working with a band like Metallica when you took them from that to that level with uh, you know the, the Black Album. Well, it, it, that's a very controversial album. But realistically, what I I had no preconceived notion of what it was going to be. It was just a question of what I knew how to make records. For instance, they never played live in the studio, ever. All their previous records, and that's the only way I knew how to make a record. So I said, this is how I do it. This is what you're all going to play at the same time. <laughs> and, you know, so you go, it's basically teaching them what I know and combining that with what they know. And the record becomes what it is. It's certainly not no preconception. Well, that explains a lot why it's so good, though. It's well, it's, it, it, this is the thing. It's, it's you know, records, uh, I heard something on the radio off that album, for instance. And, I, you know, I go like, I don't think I could do it again. Not so much sonically, but... It's the spirit of the band at that time where right. they are in terms of their writing, in terms of where I was, you know. Yeah. We're all learning together, actually. That record, for instance, uh, the challenges, the yeah. sound of the record itself, technically, is uh, there was all these problems that I had to solve that other people before me didn't solve. And so that's the sound of that record. And, right. and it was nothing that, it wasn't knowledge, it was just in that particular kind of situation. All the records I've done are all the same. I'm sure it must be right back to when Shell made records. It's really a product of the people are in the studio with what you know and you're just trying to make the best record you can. Yeah. Well, I, actually, I agree if I may step in here of and say that. I, Please do. All, all of us, uh, I think, started out as engineers, which is interesting. And I think I also totally agree with the fact that the records I made then, the records I would make now, pretty much sound the same because you, it is all we are hearing uh, music or sound in a certain way. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, you, you guys, one of the things we talked about is the sound and vision and, and Robert come up with the uh, name for the panel. But uh, 
You know, there's a lot to do too. With that's what I meant by the vision. It's yeah. like you, we all have a vision of what we what we're looking well, to achieve, and the yeah. and the and the power of sound. I mean, sound cre creates emotion, uh, and and you know, but if you make a record sound a certain way, I mean, it just it's sort of like you listen to rock around the clock, and that 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 sound of that backbeat, it's exciting, and it's yeah. like you know, and and that sound creates that excitement, and the, and the same thing goes with all different aspects of emotions when you make a record, and. That's what everybody, I think all of us, if I may say so myself, but all of us, that's one of the things that we all do, you know, yeah. and that's kind of nice we're all together. But anyway. Well, so many people have asked me, um, how can you do Metallica and then do Michael Buble? I mean, they are the opposite, opposite ends of the kind of like musical spectrum. And to me, both, it's, it's about melody, it's about sound, and it's about what you hear. So whether it's a 60-piece swing orchestra, in East West, in that wonderful studio there, um, or it's Metallica in a in a room. It's still the same thing. It's 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 a feeling. It's a time, and it's really about. So it doesn't matter whether it's a guitar sound or an orchestra. Yeah. You're just yeah. trying to make a record. Whatever's there, you try and make that work as a record because records are beautiful, whether yeah, it's, it's in digital form or whatever. <laughs> What's that? And it's about the songs also. It's about the songs. That's oh, what yeah. I mean. It's yeah. so, it, to me, it's bringing the best out of whether it's Michael Bublé or James Hetfield. What's well, he saying? I, How can I frame it in a way? Yeah, yeah, what I think I'm saying is that I think all of us, uh, whether we have actually voiced it or not, have a pretty good idea of what a hit song is supposed to be like as opposed to uh, a not hit song. In other words, things I've said before is that a, a lousy band with a great song would have a hit, but... Uh, a really great band with a bad song, it's never going to happen. That's right. Exactly. I've tried to fix a lot of them. It doesn't work. <laughs> no. <laughs> Especially in the yeah. 80s. Yeah. <laughs> I got a long way with the snare drum sound, let's put it that way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I never really felt, you know, I mean, uh, p p p people will, will, you know, will pigeonhole like with criticizing or things like that, but I really don't find much difference between working with Elvin Jones or Chris Isaac to Imagine Dragons to me it's all just you know you, exactly. you, you listen to what the melody is or the words are and you hopefully figure out a you know a vision that's going to fit with the band that's also going to make that's you know that's going to, to bring out what the song is trying to say yeah. um, and hopefully you're successful at that yeah keep trying anyway. yeah you know yeah that's great Shell, we, told, we were talking for a while, we were talking about how mic placement had a lot to do with the, the sound of what you were getting when you were recording those incredible songs that jumped out of the speakers, and which everyone here has done on the panel. But when you, you got there, you, you met, once mentioned to me that they started out with just about three microphones on the drums yeah. when you were there. Yeah, right? when I first got to London, everybody was... I, I think what they, they used to describe the music as uh, was polite, and uh, uh, the heavy-duty sounds just weren't happening. And as an engineer, I would spent a lot of time uh, working with uh, isolation and bike placement. And so when I arrived in London, I had been I worked out how to do drums with a dozen bikes. And uh, the first session I did, I was. They said, "This is what I want to do." They said, "You can't do that. It will phase. It will distort." I said, "I guess you just have to watch me." And uh, two months later, everybody was using a dozen mics. So, <laughs> oh, it's that's, you that's, that's responsible. That's <laughs> 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 great. Uh <-huh. laughs> and that was. I mean, the other thing was the sound on uh, on those records. I mean, they really jumped out of the speaker. The, you know, the, the volume of them. You know the feel; they were they felt thick. You could really you could feel all the instrumentation. And when Bob and everybody down here was talking about that excitement, the thing, the energy you got from the songs, yeah. was that before you know you started really doing that on those records. I mean, did you get like pushback from some of the studios over there? Because like you said, there were the guys in the lab coats. They're really polite. Uh, they were trying to didn't want to. No, push no, them. really, because of the fact that I was quote unquote the producer. So therefore, it was. You know my game to win or lose, and uh, uh, the, the one captain of the ship that was me, and uh, so I said, "This is the way we're going to do it." And uh, they may have complained, but they didn't complain to me because uh, that's the way I decided I was going to do it. But, well, I knew it was going to work that way because I'd uh, done it before. I knew it would, how it would turn out, so it was not a problem just to insist on 
doing it in a particular fashion. Working with a drummer like Keith Moon, uh, at, we, was, uh, was there ever a time yeah. that recording and capturing his sound was hard? What was that like in the studio? Now, Keith, Keith was, in my opinion, and probably a lot of other people's, the greatest rock drummer of all time. And uh, Keith, uh, as wild as he may have been in the studio, was brilliant. And I'll tell you one quick story in that uh, I had him in front of my 12 mic setup. I said, Keith, please do me a favor. I don't care how close you get to the mic, don't hit it. He said, no problem. He came within a millimeter, but he never hit any of the mics. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, no. Yeah, that's great, though, but this sounds absolutely I, incredible. Uh, Matt, if, yeah. if, can I ask Shell something? Absolutely. Sure. So who played the guitar so on, on You Really Got Me? I mean, for the 500th time, it was, yes. it was, Dave, it was Dave Davies, not nice. Jimmy Page. I had to clear that up. <laughs> yeah. There's been so many rumors. It's yeah. good to know it was Dave. Well, yeah. I, think, I think Jimmy's finally acknowledged that he did not play the solo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And he didn't play the solo on any other Kink songs, right? No, he did not. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's awesome. Yeah. Right, it's yeah. good to straighten that out, Bob. Well, right. sorry, you know, it's, it's that that's rock one of the big rumors, stuff, right? You know. yeah. no, I, I think that's the question I've been asked most in, in, in the whole time I've been uh, interviewed and asked questions is, who played this? Did Jimmy play, play the soul? No, he did not. Sorry. Uh, the, <laughs> you know, when you talk about the Mike thing, um, uh, a thing happened uh, with Michael Bublé on the last record that I did, that uh -huh. uh, I was a multi-mic guy and have been for many, many years. But when I went to mix a big band song, right. we ended up using just Michael's vocal mic and a Deca tree, which is three microphones. Right. And as, mad, as, as hard as I tried to get better, I could never better a rough mix that I did with basically the Deca tree and his vocal. I now, tried I'm, so hard. So it's like it, it really, in the, it's the end result of a record that, that counts. But I'm with you, multi mics, and it just ended up being that. Uh, I had the yeah. same experience. Well, I, I just add that multi mics where they are, they are applicable to the situation. Exactly. Uh, obviously, big bands from the 40s uh, were not mics with multiple mics. They were mics with maybe three or four mics yeah. uh, as, as all overheads. And you know, some of those uh, records are, 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 are incredible and unbeatable. So you know, it, it does work. Yeah. Uh, I think with more mics placed properly, yes, we have more control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you were going to say something? Well, no, I was just going to say I had the same, the same experience with the, I was doing a record with Jennifer Warrens and there was a big, we did strings in London and, it, and, there were, and we, we were trying to mix the record and the, I had multiple mics on the drums, but I had used these two, there were these two room mics that were close enough to the drums. And I ended up using those for the drums on that record because it wasn't appropriate to use, just exactly what Bob was saying. Yeah. It was just because of the, the, the ambience of the orchestra and everything. Sure. It just didn't Fitting with a big orchestra, so that was the right thing to do. Exactly. It just fits yeah. better, yeah. yeah. I mean, also, when you're doing a big orchestra, the, I mean, they're, they're not all playing with headphones. They really monitor their dynamics yeah. internally, and a lot of times right. you actually get more natural dynamics of what the band's doing. Well, the, the greatest thing about what we're talking about now is, is that really you never know when you go into a studio what you end up <laughs> using yeah. to make the record. And that's why records today is still really interesting and I'm gonna make records as long as I can because it's still never, nothing's a sure thing, right from the first record I've made to the last one I made. Right. It's all that experience of whatever you have to do it to, to get the sound. It's, it's, it's a learning process, I'm still learning and I continue well, to and learn. As, and as the, uh, the, the technology increases, it's certainly a continually continuing learning situation because otherwise you're going to be left behind. Exactly. Yeah. The greatest thing about what we have now is, is, is really we get to capture moments digitally with wonderful mics and wonderful performances now. It actually, it, it's almost like we're going back in time. I find I do less now, less microphones to get the same result. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's about the records that you made, Shell, and other people made that still is a reference point of how a record should be made, which is really that, that capturing the spirit of that artist, so. so well, I think it's back, we were back in the primitive days, so <laughs> uh, I suppose that's, that's really down to basics, and uh, certainly it's a... Ooh. Um, oh. Hey, do we have our tech guy available? Lost his feed. Uh, we, we lost. 
Okay. You're, you're back. Uh, if you're you can back. Please. Okay. No, we got right. we got you back. Show. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. Now, I wanted to ask uh, everybody on the, on the on our panel here, Shell, starting with you, because you know, who do, you, do you, who is it? Do you have a favorite producer who inspired you, or an engineer? Was there somebody in particular who made you want to? Do uh, you know, or I, mentored I was, you. The, uh, yes, well, the guy that I went to work for at Conway Studios, his name was Phil Yuen, who was English, and actually worked at IBC Studios in uh, uh, London. It's the guy that taught me, and but we are talking about a situation where uh, we had, you know, the most we had was three track, and we had a, a console with rotary pots, so there wasn't all that much to teach, but the main thing I had to learn was how to plug up uh, the, the board. and. Uh, from that, so we're really talking about a, a, a time and a place that doesn't exist now because everything is so much more complicated. Uh, it, it was fun to do. In fact, I did my first solo session <clears throat> three days after I started at the studio <laughs> and, uh, and sweated about 10 pounds of, uh, of almost bullets because they asked me to do a, uh, uh, an edit which I was totally incapable of doing, and somehow managed to get it right. <laughs> That's good. That's I awesome. went through that. I went through that. Yeah. Excellent. How about you, Rob? Is there somebody that inspired you and other producers? I would say, you know, I'd have to say George Martin, and uh, and that just because of my age and you know, in those early Beatles records, and you know, it's funny because I used to look at the records that my parents had, and and it it didn't say produced by, it said. Uh, uh, directed by or, or supervisor or something, you know, didn't say produced at the time. And so when I got into this business, I didn't know that there was such thing as a producer. I just thought it was the engineer in the band, right? And so when I got into it and I found that I wasn't in control, when I was, became an engineer, I was like, that, I wasn't good with that. I thought, <laughs> you know, this isn't going to work for me, you know? So that's the producer thing was there. So George Martin would be that one. And then Jimmy Miller also. I really felt Jimmy Miller was incredible. I mean, he was so feel-oriented, and he, he was really good, Getting got great sounds, and he made really timeless records, and I, I really respected him a lot. We got to be good friends, and I, I really learned a lot from him. I agree. I knew him well, and he was a terrific guy, and a nice guy, very good producer. Yeah, That's... very good, very good. And George was, you know, George was George. I mean, you know, he, he's a very good yep. example. Because I, I saw Phil Spector, you know, when I, I used to hitchhike to Gold Star and when I was 15, and <laughs> I got to watch Phil Spector work, and uh, I didn't, I, I don't know. I mean, he was, he was a producer that was an artist, you know, like the singer on his records was just a singer. It was, Phil was more of the artist, but I didn't like the whole way he did, I didn't like that kind of approach that much, even though it was kind of interesting. You know how he used to, everybody's probably heard this story, but he would make the band play eight bars of the song <laughs> for like three hours. And, and, and then, and they'd be so pissed off and so full of adrenaline, after those three hours, he'd finally let him do a full take, and of course, you know, bang, well, you know. May, may I interject here in memory of somebody who's no longer with us? The guy who was responsible for that sound was, was Stan Ross. Oh, absolutely. That's and, right. yeah, uh, yeah. and he never really got the credit for it. You know, I have a great, I, I have to tell, take the opportunity to tell the Stan Ross story, so... I'm, 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 you know, sneaking into Gold Star and hanging around, and I finally get invited into the control room after about a month. So I, and I got to sit on some Phil Spector sessions, and so he's doing this session with Stan Ross, engineering, and uh, and so he punches in, and he punches into the wrong track, and uh, he erased about ten seconds of a choir, and that was an expensive session. I, it was a thirty-piece choir, and that's a problem, right? So. <laughs> he turns to Phil and says, Phil, I, 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 I just erased the choir. And Phil looked at him. He didn't, didn't get angry. He had this look of, of like, like he had just heard that his mother had died or something. <laughs> and, 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 he, and, and what he did was, I was sitting on the couch in the back. He, he pushed his chair back, and he dove under the console and started sobbing. And, and so I, I knew that that was my cue to leave the room, obviously, so I left. Well, it turns out that, that, that uh, Stan told me that it t he stayed under there for three and a half hours. And he yeah. said, so imagine being Stan, you know, so what, what he was, you know, and he was such a well, sweet guy. Stan, anyway. Stan, was, Stan was lucky uh, later on in his life with a pull of guns. So. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Shoot the speaker or someone else, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
Now, how about you, Mark? Who, who, who inspired you? I mean, I grew up in a little bit of a bubble because I didn't work as in professional studios as an assistant engineer. I just kind of started my own. I met Glenn Johns pretty early on, and I think he was a real inspiration. He came and like looked around our studio and you know and, and spent spent a couple of days with us, going you know go, going to what we're doing. That was. That was a real inspiration to me. I was, uh, there was another guy named Fred Cotero who used to work oh, yeah. at, at I Wally Fred. Hiders. Yeah, yeah. I, knew, I, I knew Fred from when I was probably Santana 16, and all that 16 stuff. 17. And Fred, Fred was a big influence on me. Fred was you know, great. I, I, I could, he'd let me come in and hang out sometimes and watch what he was doing so I could go back and, all right, now what was he doing here with this? You, know, yeah. uh, you can go back and work on it for a little while, which is, which yeah. is great. I love that. Bob, how about yourself? Well, um, being an artist. Looking, looking back, now at the record since the 60s, um, I would agree with what these gentlemen said in terms of Jimmy Miller because um, uh, really the records that he made uh, are just, you could really just hear that he always served the band, the song, exactly. and didn't change much. He was just, he, it seemed like he was that all-purpose guy, which is something that I always strive for. But yeah. I do have to mention somebody else, and, and this gets into kind of a muse thing. And uh, it's Mick Ronson, as yeah. Matt, we were talking about. And he was uh, this, uh, the guy that played uh, guitar for Bowie for many years and was also an arranger. He arranged the strings, et cetera, for Bowie and just a musical director. And he, I was lucky enough that he produced my, my band's uh, two albums. And he taught me basically about serving the song. Once a song is written, you find the home for the song, where it should be, where it, it, it's the best. And the other thing he taught me is what not to do. And I'll tell a story about a song that most people won't know. It's a song called Eyes of a Stranger that my band did. And I had done a demo over a, <clears throat> a commercial uh, by myself with a drum machine and a drummer. And I made the demo for the record company. Now Mick Ronson came in and he heard all our other songs and had great suggestions. That one he says, we're not gonna get it better than that, Bob. And I'm going like, really? And what I'm saying is he heard the song and he heard the feel and he's, he, didn't have to, he didn't have to change it. He just went, that's fine, this is what we do and that's the record. Yeah. And I always found that, that that was a real big point for me. It's almost like what not to do and respect the beauty of what you're listening to. Yeah, where, knowing, to where, where to stop. Yeah. Where to knowing stop. when to stop. It's and when to stop. Big. Yeah, that's what a lot of artists don't know anything so, about. <laughs> so he was a very big muse and, and he's continued to be. And, and like I said, I'm still learning how to make great records. And, but that, that was a real big point. But Jimmy Miller was something else. Yeah, he really was. Yeah. I mean, like you said, he really served the band and he was so feel oriented and he was a great drummer. And you know, he, he was just, he was really something. I mean, I, I really had a lot of respect for him. And working on the records where you know, they would experiment, like use a little tape recorder and record the intro to Street Fighting Man or something. And it had a different, such a different Actually, tone. That was, that was Keith, that wasn't, yeah. that, had, that yeah. had nothing to was do with Keith's Jimmy. Idea but to do? Jimmy, Jimmy, but Jimmy facilitated all That's of that exactly stuff. That's exactly it. And, I mean, it, but Keith yeah. had the idea to take the acoustic, run it. he had a little, one of those little cassette recorders with one speaker in it and he, Recorded the guitar onto onto that cassette player, and then he plugged that thing into a, into an amp and played that back, and then that and then they mic'd that. But Jimmy took what Keith's idea and and made it work, right? And that's, yeah, that's what that's, that's what he was great at. You yeah. know, it's like he didn't tell Keith, "You can't do that," or you, you know, "That'll never work." I mean, he instead just be, was you know t he could turn on a dime and just do the right thing, and and without and effortlessly. You know, that was the thing about him. He was. Uh, he created a good atmosphere, and he got rid of obstacles, you know, because confusion is the enemy of creativity, right? And he, <laughs> he, was, he was good at keeping the confusion to a minimum and, and getting right to the heart of the matter. I, I, so, I, I, I find these days, too, I still, I mean, I learn a lot from the bands that I'm working with, especially sure. since so many bands are, are actually doing pretty competent or interesting recordings on their own. I mean, I, I just worked out with this band, Mute Math, and yeah. I mean, I get I get to demo this like get to, just the whole way they were approaching. I mean, it's very unconventional the way they were approaching their sound. There's nothing that I would ever would have come to without without r r really listening to what they'd done on their demos. And I was like, well, you know, I I really changed my approach. I, how can I just like what can, what small things can I do to make this demo better? Because I mean, yeah. they, they they already just had a great feel. I, I find that a lot with. 
a lot of the younger bands that I work with. Yeah. I, every, every time I work on one of these projects, it's a little bit of a learning experience for me, just looking at the, you know, I mean, they, they don't have any rules. They, they haven't been doing this for 40 years, and they'll just try incredibly unconventional things. Well, the, um, what you were talking about in particular, like Street Fighting Man, it's, it's kind of amazing that people in, make records in their bedrooms now, and that started in a bedroom on a small tape recorder. And it's really, once again, it's we're still making records, and uh, the same way as people are making it today. You That's know, true. like you, you know, what you could do in the studio. It's, it's uh, I did Van Morrison last year in England, and I was on my flight. I did vocal comps with my laptop. Right. I mean, think about that. That's incredible, but still <laughs> retaining. You know, the right. record, but yeah, just yeah. technology today allows us to even make better records. No, I, I agree with that totally. I mean, it's, there's a lot of people that gripe about technology, but it's a question of, you know, you've got a lot to choose from now, and it's a question of making the right choices. I mean, you don't, everything doesn't work, but you sure yeah. got some tools that you never had. I got to tell you one quick story about this, talking about sound and stuff. Just, I don't know if everybody, anybody's aware of this. When Buddy Holly made those early records, and he made him with, you know, in, in Lubbock, but uh, he, when he went to Nashville, you know, he, there's, the recordings he did in Nashville don't have any drums on them, and you know why? <laughs> because they didn't know how to record drums in Nashville at that time. <laughs> so they, he got, the drummer got there and they said, we, well, he, he's not going to be able to play because they had never recorded a drum <laughs> set. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I just found this out about a year ago. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. But well. that shows you how, you know, talking about how things sound influences things and all these things that we're talking about. I just thought that's, a, that's an interesting opposite extreme example, you know. You know, I have to also ask, as all the four of you as producers, one of the things that, you know, I love about some of those records and our character and getting back to Street Fighting Man, I'm going to mention this again. When Charlie comes in late, right before the second verse, mm -hmm. it's those little nuances that are things that are oh, Keith oh, Stone's yeah. characters, right? Absolutely. That's the night that I first worked with the Rolling Stones and Keith stayed to do some bass overdubs. Everybody left. And so I'm standing behind him. He's sitting at the console with a bass and he's playing and he turns around to me and he says, I just play until I make the right mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. exactly what you're talking that's about. Funny. I mean, how about, how about for you, Bob? Do you find if there's something. Well, that I, it, it's almost like if going back from the very early records from the 50s until now, it's, it's almost like the mistakes, the, the bad moves that I made in a mix and the mistakes I hear on other records. For instance, like, why are tambourines on Motown songs so loud? Right. You know, I never understood. You, really? You, that's where you hear it? And I was talking to Gabe from the Dap Kings, who's a great producer, Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. He produces their records. And we were talking about records. He says, well, Bob, they probably put that tambourine on and mastering. And I'm going like, really? And that was, that's that thing of making a record, no matter what it takes, right up to mastering. So you can imagine the perspective change of actually, while they're mastering, Cutting a record. Right. They're overdubbing a tambourine. I've got a question. That, that is I've got a question for you guys since you just said that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we are all what I term as hands on producers. We're there from birth till death, you know, with, with the band and the songs, the arrangements. And uh, I had one bad experience where I let somebody else do the mastering. It never happened again. So I'm always there for the mastering. Are you, the, you guys who all do, do the same thing? Well, yeah, with me, uh, I actually used a guy, George Marino, um, who unfortunately passed away. That's and the insane. mastering guy, like in the early days, he fixed my work. <laughs> right. He made me a better engineer up until we ended up, in other words, he got used to my work. And it's somebody that I always knew would respect that was there. So um, I think some of the mastering engineers are the real geniuses when they cut vinyl. Those guys really helped us make better records. Absolutely, and that was a miracle that they even worked. It's just vinyl. <laughs> yeah, like it, it's it's not just compression and loud. They, you know, it's it's more about like my mistakes that I made. George helped me fix it. Right. So they were true, truly great people. That uh, when you find a good one, stick with them. Well, yeah, it, I learned to master in the beginning. I learned how to master vinyl records because I wanted to know about how to get, you know, what I was going to be doing, I'm, what I was mixing. I wanted to make sure I could get it on a record, so I learned to master. I, I knew George from the record plant, you know, when he started, the, had the cutting room there. That was his first yeah. place. 
But you know, the other interesting thing about what you were talking about is that Papa's got a brand new bag. Have you ever heard that the, the, before the mastering? That where it's, it, what happened was they just got off the road and they'd cut the song. And so James thought that every, they sounded a little tired. So when they did the mastering, he had them speed it up. And then they added that reverb to it, that, that characteristic reverb that makes that song was exactly. not on the mi mix. It was Mistake. done in, in the mastering. So like what you're talking about with the tambourine, that's a pretty amazing thing, actually. It is great. Yeah. Now, um, I need to ask you, Shell, about my generation when that thing was recorded, because of, of, we speak about chaos and Keith being such a great drummer, but when all that stuff and that sound came together, when it really, right, right when it explodes and goes all, all off into like the organized chaos there yeah. towards the end of the song, tell me what that was like capturing that and did you do it more than more than a few times? How many times <clears> did you do the, uh, the whole thing took uh, five takes with uh, probably three of them stopped in the middle. So uh, I, I got to preface by saying that I, I just, I never walked into the studio uh, not knowing how we were going to do the song. They, it was rehearsed before we got in there, and I spent a lot of time with Pete uh, miking up the, the the guitar from three different angles uh, so that we actually uh, captured all the the uh, the sound that it is on my generation. Mm. You know, uh, that it, it was difficult because nobody had ever done it as far as I knew. And, uh, you know, so I had to take into account the acoustics of the room, and we finally arrived at what we thought was really cool. And uh, so it, it went extremely well. I said, you know, total of five takes to do it. That's amazing. That's, That's awesome. great. Yeah. That's, great. That's interesting what you said about the, liking the guitar from the different angles, because that's what's co so great about that recording is you captured the atmosphere so well, well and the excitement, well, like Bob was saying, you know, that's yeah. you did a hell of a job there, boy. Thank you. Yeah. Well, when I tried, I, I hit one mic close, I had one mic about four or five feet away, right. and I had a, a third mic that was capturing the, uh, the, the sound bouncing around the room. Yeah. So that's that, when I combined them all, that's what we finally wound up with. And, and I'm going to try that. Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Tell me that, that you are. Yeah. Um, I got to, one thing. It's uh, so much about what you're talking about is also workarounds and finding ways to make records uh, happen. Like you were saying, getting three guitar or three mics to get Pete Townsend sound. It was interesting when I mixed the Black Album. Um, uh, the record before, uh, there wasn't a lot of bottom end on the record, and it's quite famous for that. That's true. Um, and when I talked to them, uh, when we went to mix, um, what it came down to was the compression on the bus, and they kept turning down the bass until James's guitar sound sounded big and heavy, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I started to mix. I had a bus compressor, and James says, no, you can't do that. And I'm going like, but that's part of my vibe. Okay, mm. but I had to do a workaround, and so I was in the room by myself going like, what am I going to do? Ended up, I was in a room where I could separate the drum compression from the guitar compression, mm. and that is the sound of the Black Album. Oh, wow. that, was, that was not preconceived, that was just a workaround because the guitar player said, this is what you got to do, and I had to do it. Right. It was not about me and what I did, it was him. <laughs> and it's almost the same thing, you working with Pete Townsend, getting that right. sound. That's what you got to do. That's well, what a yeah, great it, producer does, I believe. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I think obviously, you, you, well, I think you discuss it as much as you can with uh, the band and whatever. And, and uh, I think it's fair to say we all have uh, a, a vision in mind of how this thing is supposed to turn out and kind of work towards it. But workarounds certainly are part of what we've all done one time or another because. Uh, sometimes the, the equipment doesn't work, and you have to work around it. So uh, I, I think that's, you know, I, I think the bottom line is that very few people know what we actually do. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. I mean, actually, I think the more uncomfortable I am, I actually make better records. Right. <laughs> I agree with that, you know, too. Because I actually have to, because otherwise I go to the same thing I always go to. Right. So. Well, it's easy to come in with a vision, but that vision's usually constantly evolving to, you know, right. to every exactly. problem or every <laughs> exactly. bit that a band member has. Or it really, know. records come down to the people in the room, the music, yeah. the, the, the song, the lyrics, all that stuff that is, you just don't know how it's going to go. But yeah. that's what makes it 
interesting and yeah. a great art form. The, the environment, too, I might add. I, I did a record with this guy, and he said, uh, I want to do it. was a trumpet, a, a guitar, and an upright bass. And so he said, I got this warehouse under the Brooklyn Bridge, and he said, uh, you know, would, would you consider doing this recording in there? And I had some equipment. I said, sure. So, but we walked into that place, and he had some girl put flowers and candles in there. And I walked in there and just gasped. I went, oh, you know, and it was like the most unbelievable scene you've ever seen. And we, and that sound came out on the record. I mean, it was like, so I think that also can play into it. I did a sub dudes record where we did the entire record by candlelight. We never lit an electric bulb <laughs> in six weeks. We'd have a one or a two candle session, you know, the four hour candles that would burn down. And yeah, that's kind of funny. I just thought that's, that, that gets into the vision part a little bit. <laughs> I think I would have fallen asleep. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that would be possible, but it didn't happen that way. Guys, uh, we have to wrap it up, uh, and I could just listen to you guys talk for the next two or three hours. I wish we could do a marathon workshop here with you. Do you have yeah. anything you'd like to say in closing uh, before we stop? I'll start with you on the end there, Bob. Is there anything you'd uh, like? Just a, advice for, for people out there that... Might I, think about I would just say keep great making great records and music and just don't let it die and and humans are coming back real humans <laughs> playing real instruments it's a good yeah. thing yeah. yeah I agree with that 100% it's great what about yourself I'd love to hear Mark uh, I mean my advice to people doing production is just really listen to the song first in whatever its simplest form and you know to, to, to Try to do no harm, you know, just to, 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 to see, see what you can do to make that that actually brings out what the emotion that people are trying to that they're trying to get across lyrically yeah. in the song. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Like I, every time I work with an artist, I like to hear the songs <clears throat> on one instrument, you know, just vocal and and the song. I think that's important. And I think the other most important thing is to admit to yourself when you don't know what you're doing. I mean, like to not bulldoze through situations and try to fake anything. It's like if once you admit that you that you don't know something, then you're going to be open to learning, and you're going to turn a corner, and you're going to be amazed where it takes you. And I think that's really important because a lot of people come and want to come in and have an attitude. And, yeah, I'm badass, or I know what I'm. You know, and forget all that baloney. I mean, it's like we're all just students. You know, just like Bob said, we every we just learn every day. So please try, try to keep that humility, and let's keep human beings playing music, like Bob said. Absolutely, fantastic, and Shell. What would you like uh, to say in closing to everybody? I don't think I can add anything because it's all just been said and I agree with everything everybody said. That is the thing to do. And if uh, uh, any of you artists out there uh, uh, will get that message uh, that they will be the next generation to make great records. That's right. That's great. Hey, guys, let's hear for our panelists, everyone. And thank you for all the amazing records that you guys produced and worked on that have been soundtracks uh, to our lives and continue to be. So thank you. And thank you, Matt.